Oh, that was a voice. <laughs> uh, hello, people are starting to get in. So welcome cool. to our event tonight. Uh, we are here with Beth Morgan and Jen Kyung Frazier. Uh, sorry, Jean Kyung Frazier. No worries. I did a pronunciation check like 30 seconds ago. <laughs> we, we all agreed that we're very nervous, so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, today we are going to be talking about and celebrating Beth's debut novel, A Touch of Jen. Uh, my name's Devil. Uh, my name's not Devil. My name's Devin. Uh, I'm from the Clement <laughs> store. Incredible. And uh, we're going to, I'm just going to announce some upcoming events and then we'll get right into the main, main attraction. So tomorrow we have Jamie Lowe and Kim uh, Kelly discussing Lowe's new book, Breathing Fire female inmate firefighters on the front lines of California's wildfires. Uh, so this book grew out of a uh, New York Times Magazine piece where <coughs> she basically embedded with these um, female inmate firefighters. There's, there's about 200 of them and they live together in a camp. And uh, the book is just basically getting their, getting their stories, getting their lives and uh, following along as they get into firefighting. Um, very dramatic, uh, very timely as we are currently on fire everywhere. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's tomorrow. Um, on a lighter note, since today we're doing a book about social media weirdness, I figured I'd mention that on September 9th, we are going to be uh, providing books for an offsite event um, for a comedian and author named Wayne Moore, who is doing a show at the rickshaw stop called Tinder Live. Uh, it is basically what it sounds like, uh, she gets up on stage and does Tinder live um, with audience input and uh, feedback and occasionally uh, phone calls with Tinder dates, um, if that's up your alley of strangeness. So on to tonight's event. Uh, we are here. Um, our, uh, our guest for the night uh, is Beth Morgan who grew up outside Sherman, Texas, studied writing as an undergraduate at Sarah Lawrence College and is currently completing an MFA at Brooklyn College. Uh, her work has been published in the Iowa Review and the Kenyan Review Online. Uh, we're gonna be talking about her debut novel, A Touch of Gem. Uh, our conversation partner tonight is the author of Pizza Girl, Jean Kyung Fraser, who lives in LA. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to the two of you and uh, take it away. Thanks, Devin. Um, no, so, so thankful to be here. Thanks for everyone coming out. Uh, we're going to start it off with the reading from Beth and her amazing debut right here. Let's do it. Oh, you got a little visual. I, had a, I do, I had of a, course. I hold it up at some point. <laughs> Mine is reversed, so you can't see it. Yeah, uh, here we can do it at the same time, but yeah. Yeah, there we Here's go. Here's Beth's hardcover. Everyone should go out and get it or order it through Green Apple if you can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Green Apple, for having me. Thank you, Jean, <laughs> for doing this. This is like, this, this is this is so cool. Um, I'm right gonna on. I'm gonna start with a reading from close to the beginning of the book. Um, yeah, I guess I'll give a little bit of an elevator pitch of what the book is about, which is that. Remy and Alicia are two service workers who they're in a relationship and Remy about two years ago he worked with this girl Jen at a restaurant called Velasco's and he hasn't seen her in years but he had a huge crush on her at the time and since then he's been stalking her on Instagram basically and after a while he gets his girlfriend Alicia also to be obsessed with her but they, so they think about her a lot. They talk about her a lot. They even use her, you know, they even role play as Jen a little bit in their sex life. And, but they haven't seen her in a long time. And so this is where I'm going to, that's all you need to know for where I'm going to. <laughs> Do you have a page number so we can flip along? Ooh, got a the page book? number. Yeah, yeah. I think it's page 22. Yeah. Right on. Wow. I think I'm wrong. It's cool. Remy is invited to the house party of a friend from school with whom he's not particularly close. Neither of them wants to go, but Alicia keeps saying that something momentous is about to occur. Remy treats this as a joke, but has started to get the same feeling 
no matter how irrational it is. Yes, something momentous might occur. Maybe he'll see someone he hasn't seen in a long time. The party is an expensively renovated brownstone, the front door bracketed with security cameras that don't attempt to blend into the pre-war moldings. Isn't it crazy? I'm house sitting, says the friend. He gestures at the chandelier, the artwork, and a shaggy little dog. The dog flips down the staircase towards them like a hairdo. The friend scoops up the dog and aims it at them in a way that demands compliments. They compliment the dog. I love showering here, says the friend. I had to look up some of the shampoos online. Each bottle is like $60. He, he, get, he tells them about other expensive items in the house. He gives them an update on how his career is doing and then disappears for the rest of the evening. Remy and Alicia wander around with plastic cups. They don't know anyone except an old coworker that Remy doesn't feel like talking to. Alicia says, we should just be friendly. We never go out. I'm sure we'll know some other people here. Remy walks systematically through each room, onto the patio, then back into the house. He doesn't look back to check that Alicia's following him, since he knows she will. They wander into the kitchen near the alcohol and examine the greeting cards on the refrigerator. One of them has a picture of a donut on the front and says, I do not know how to thank you enough. Another one says, out of all the faces in the world, yours is my absolute favorite. What a weird card, says Remy. Yeah, it sounds like this girl wants to peel off your face and wear it. A strange girl tries to participate in the conversation. Yeah, that's exactly what it sounds like, weird. Alicia looks at the stranger with frightened eyes. The girl's face is made up into try-hard brilliance. Remy and Alicia adjust their bodies to shut her out. I thought, he says to Alicia, when I was walking through the rooms just now, I thought for a second that maybe there was a chance, you know, she might come later. She's been posting pictures of jewelry, so I don't think she's traveling. They refill their cups. Out of boredom, they do shots of vodka. Woo, says Alicia, after her second shot. The strange girl claps confusedly. They stay for an hour, but don't see anyone else they know. The next day, Remy finally has time to deal with the broken fan in his laptop, and he and Alicia go to the Apple store. There, they run into Jen. Remy, shell-shocked, introduces Alicia and then monitors Jen's face for a reaction when he refers to her as my girlfriend. Alicia monitors Jen's face too. Jen was another server at Belasco's before it closed, he says. Oh, really, says Alicia. He and Alicia both use exaggerated gestures of goodwill and surprise in order to appear casual, as if meeting her there affects them in no way and is just the sort of unremarkable accident one can expect in day-to-day -day urban life. It makes them both look very wild, they realize afterwards. <laughs> Jen smells strongly of body odor. She shakes Jen's ha Alicia's hand, and hugs Remy with a total lack of self-consciousness about how she smells. Remy finds this terrifying. Remy, I wish you would come out with us sometime, says Jen. You know, everyone else has really stayed connected. I'm sure you're not really connected, he says. He hears his own laugh as if from a distance. It's deranged. He turns to Alicia and explains, pretending that he's never told her this before. Jen and I hated those people. We really bonded because Velasco's was such a freak show. Oh, those were such fun times, says Jen. She doesn't take up the old mean line of conversation. I've really missed you. Alicia notices how Jen's boobs are large enough to make her stomach, as round and well hydrated as a yoga instructor's, seem smaller by comparison. She glows with health and well being. Her upper lip catches on her adult graces. She's real, she's right there. Actually, I think you'll know some of the people I'm going to surf with in July. We're going to this amazing place in the Hamptons. You should come, you should both come. They say that they don't know how to surf and Jen says that beginners are perfectly fine, that several other people coming don't have much experience at all. Their close attentive grouping around her suggests that Jen is an Apple Store employee, 
and several customers approach and then back away once they realize she doesn't wear a lanyard. Other customers linger nearby, sensing a dramatically charged quality to the atmosphere. Jen tells them about her latest trip in Indonesia, and Remy tells her about his broken computer fan. Jen's body language remains attentive while he talks, but he can sense that he's boring her. In order to appear unaffected, Remy doesn't stop talking about his computer fan. Then he overcorrects and becomes hostile. I cannot fucking believe how these companies train you to be dependent on their unethically assembled products. And then when they break, the world stops and they get you to squeeze a few dollars out of you. Yeah, says Alicia. She's trying to help. She's sweating. Yeah, says Jen. Totally. After Jen leaves, they give her a 15 minute head start, even though they have no reason to stay. They watch the demo animation on the iPads, a multicolored line twisting on a black background. They can't see Jen anymore, but they know that right now she's making a similarly bright path through space somewhere, always, in fact. I'm gonna stop there. Hell yeah. <laughs> Thank you for reading a little bit. Yeah. How did you, how did, have you, I feel like you've done a few of these at this point. Do you read something different each time or how do you, how do you know which one you want to read for an event? Yeah, I generally try and read something different each time. There are a few things mm -hmm. that I've practiced more, so I'm just like more comfortable with them. <laughs> but yeah, for sure. you know, some of these things, they like go online and they're recorded. So right. I think this thing is going on YouTube. So I just try to make sure that I'm not duplicating too many of the same of the same. Thing. Sure. What do you what do you like about that scene that you read? Um, I like that. I mean, I like that you get to see Remy and Alicia in an environment that is like a social environment because you can just tell so much about people and the way yeah. that they behave when they're in a social environment where they don't know anyone. And that it yeah. also kind of makes their bond a little bit tighter. And because that bond is such a big, it's such a central part of the book. Right. It's really cool to see it activated in this way, I guess. Or that's, that's how I feel. And no, then totally. and then you can see, you can get to meet Jen. So exactly. I was going to say, yeah, I think like it's a really cool move that you pull off in that you feel the dependency of these two characters that they have on each other. Like, I think it's really easy to write romantic relationships that are only one thing, maybe yeah. they're their love or their hate. And you feel a lot of that mixed up into this, which I think is a really natural thing that happens between two people that have just been together for a really long time. For sure. Yeah. Um, another thought I had, like, reading your book, like, how did you choose to narrate it through Remy's POV? Like, what what made you decide to do that beyond just like a character choice, but like a gender choice? I think there's a lot of pressure to write uh, the gender that you present as. For sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting because I think that I, it definitely... There are parts of the book that feel more Remy POV than, than not. Like I think especially right. in this beginning part, there's um, especially in this beginning part, there's it's a kind of free and direct that's going between Remy and Alicia more, mm -hmm. but yeah. I still feel as if it's situated more with Remy. Yeah. And I decided that basically for the simple fact that I knew where the book was going. Mm. And you know, like, I don't want to give any spoilers, but that it was just partly it was a logistical fact, right. um, but also it's just really liberating to, and the whole thing that's fun for me about fiction is getting to be in a voice that's not supernatural for me. And is the mm -hmm. challenge of like getting to be another character. Like yeah. that's fun about it because I have to, I have to be myself every day. And so getting <laughs> to be someone else is, is, is really cool. Not that all of the characters are not me, but Remy in particular right. feels specifically not me. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's, there is like, I think really smart lines and you use the third person really well to, I think is show his misogyny a little bit. 
yeah. very quiet way. Like, I mean, the section you read, I, I noted it immediately. Like, he doesn't have to look back that Alicia's following him since he knows that she will. Yeah. Um, a line that you could read over, a line that can make you really upset too. Like, I read that in my initial, I was like, ugh. You know, and I think that is a really cool mastery of both like the POV and the character that you're able to pull a line like that off without making it seem too like, look at me, look at what I'm doing. Thank you. <laughs> that makes sense. So yeah, I, um, how did I also was like reading through and I think we've talked about this a little bit too, that there are certain audiences that it's really fun when you can reach them or you read parts of the book and it's really special to certain people. And I worked in the service industry for years and that immediately was sort of what gripped me about your book and what I thought really made it stand up from the beginning was there's this beautiful scene about Remy talking about what it feels like to be on mm -hmm. during a day and what it feels like to really nail a service. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering, like, I guess this can bleed into also how you sort of constructed this novel. Like, did you know from the beginning that you wanted the characters to come from the background, like to be service? workers i i am honestly not sure at what point i decided that i think especially yeah. at the time when because you know like when books take shape you just sort of can't even remember much yeah. of the process for sure it's just yeah, lost totally. at the end of time mm -hmm. um but i think that i had an early i had a sense early on that remy was a pretty resentful character and right thinking about that, I'm not going to say that I'm a super resentful person. <laughs> Maybe, I am. Maybe I'm a little resentful, but like <laughs> the times where I felt the most resentful and the most antisocial and had the most hatred for humanity were times where I was working right. jobs that felt really demeaning mm. and having to deal with difficult people or when I felt really disrespected. So right. I did, I knew that that was what I wanted for Remy. And then it just started to make sense as I was writing that Alicia very much needed to be on the same level with him, that they needed to be mm. bonded in that way, in their sense of alienation. And right. Yeah, I think it's like key also to have like, you know, that Jen used to be in the same sort of position that they were. Yeah. And that she found a way out. Like, it, it is really hard when you have people that started in the same position as you that land somewhere else or land in a seemingly better place. Like it makes you feel a little bit more uh, chip on your shoulder, a little more upset, you know? Yeah. And that worked well. Um, but yeah, do you want to, I'm sure you've answered the question a few times, but how did this sort of take shape? Like, where did the idea come from? What did, what was this born out of? Um, it was, it was a few ideas coming together. I think mm -hmm. the moment that was the real genesis where I started to get serious about it and where the story started to take shape for me was that I was um, on vacation in the Philippines. Oh, cool. and, this, and it was, I know, it was, it was amazing. Um, yeah. I was with one of my closest friends there and it was February in New York. So it was like freezing cold and just miserable. February is the worst month in New York. And I was, I was like in this, I was in this, uh, I was on this island that was balmy and beautiful and it was so warm. And I just kept on being so freaked out and amazed and excited that these two places were existed in the same moment. And I could very well have been stuck in New York at that moment, but I wasn't, I had mm. escaped. And yeah, yeah, I mean, my God, New York. Um, but, and then what was also happening was that there was a 12 hour time difference mm. between New York and the Philippines where uh, the island that I was on was 12 hours ahead, which meant that six o'clock in New York was six o'clock in the Philippines. And that symmetry interested me on an abstract level because it, it seemed to symbolize this idea of these two moments existing at once, but also being mm. really different, completely right. different. And it seemed like a metaphor for people who were experiencing the same moment in totally different material circumstances. Cool. And so that was sort of the beginning of the idea. And then 
I just had a couple plot ideas that were bopping around in my head and they kind of like magnetized to this idea and slowly the whole thing gestated and, and that's where it came from. Like by the idea, you mean um, the sort of like monster story you're thinking about? Because isn't that funny? I guess that's what you would describe this work as, is that yeah. it is technically a horror story. But in my head, I'm like the most horrifying parts don't really have to do with the monster huh. yeah. itself, you know? So <laughs> did, the, did the plot come later or like that plot piece, I mean, or was that? I just... I had an idea, but what I didn't know was how, what you, like what you never know with any kind mm -hmm. of idea that you have is how it's going to tonally play out. Right. Like, you can have an idea for something that sounds good in theory, and then you actually write it in scene and you're like, whoa, this is <laughs> different altogether. And so right. I don't even know if I had, I don't even know if I had an idea for the monster from the beginning but I knew mm. that I wanted it to be horrifying and I just kind of was working my way towards articulating all the ways in which the horror was going to manifest. Yeah, I, I love that thought. Wait, I have to get my laptop charger, classic technical difficulty, yeah. but like if something I want to think about, because it is a big question and I don't want to spoil this for anyone, but there is like a lot of violence in this book, which I think people don't really think about because you know, you're such a talented writer and that you can really deliver lines in a, in a quiet and at times like funny way mm -hmm. so I think it's kind of overlooked but like um I was wondering if you could walk us through like how you made these decisions about portraying the violence and like how did you like manage that throughout and was it an easy decision anyway you can think about that as I get my charger okay do you want me to talk while you're getting your charger you don't have to Okay, I might just yeah. chill for a second because I like. Okay, I, yeah, it's a tough question. That's I think it's good no, time. I'll ruminate. I'll ruminate for a second. <laughs> oh well, Beth is ruminating, and Jean is getting her charger. Um, I did want to mention that we uh, do have our chat feature open, and we do also have a Q and A. Um, so if uh, you all in the TV land out there have any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Um, ruminate away. Did Devin help me out while I was oh, being yeah. a dummy? All right, I got it. I'm so sorry about that. Um, please, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess your question is a little bit related to what we were just talking about in terms of tone. Yeah, totally. There's clearly a difference between tone as it functions in Spider-Man or a Marvel movie as opposed to the way that it functions in a Lars von Trier movie. It's, it just, it hits different, depending. And I, the violence that is in A Touch of Jen, I heard someone once, uh, a reviewer described it as campy, which I think is pretty legit. Like at times it is, yeah. it is campy. Um, and that yeah. was something that I was aiming for to mm. because I wanted to, do a very subtle tonal shift a right. little on because the book the book takes a left turn yeah uh, like midway through the book and a big part of the challenge of writing that was that I had to think about what moments do I want to have this play as almost slapstick right and when are the times when I want to puncture this tonally where mm -hmm. I sort of pull the rug out from the reader's feet and make them kind of realize like, oh, like this was kind of funny or this felt like I was watching a movie a little bit, but it's actually pretty horrible what's happening. <laughs> so that was, I don't know if I pulled that off, but that was definitely the goal. And it was definitely what I was constantly adjusting and thinking about throughout. Mm -hmm. like, how do I make this feel like a movie and how do I make it feel not like a movie and when? Yeah. Yeah. And like making those choices, I guess, has a lot to do with like time shift as well. Like when you want a reader to sit in scene, when you want them to move ahead, like even the, like the section you read, you have, they stay for an hour, but don't see anyone else they know to end a sort of section, which is, is a quiet, like tonal and um, transition choice. Yeah. 
you know, that you can summarize an entire evening in a way just like that. Like yeah. just two people waiting, hoping for something to happen, nothing happening. And choosing when to do that with like violence as well, as opposed to that you can make those decisions. I don't know. Um, like did there, were there like, you know, I don't know how much people know about the editing process, but things can change like really drastically between like one draft in the next like do you want to talk in like a technical way about that like how many revisions did a touch of gen go through and what what do you feel like were if any like major choices you made or changes you made throughout that process i think for me i actually a huge part of revision for me is actually starting over it's a oh, huge so i just start over like repeatedly mm -hmm. i um and I probably started from the beginning with this one at least eight times. Oh, wow. And that doesn't, which is not to say that I changed everything immediately. Like there are right. where I would copy and paste something into the new document. But when I revise, I try to put myself in a headspace where I'm thinking, I'm writing right now. I'm looking at the, my former draft, but I'm still in a creative mindset. I'm not editing. I'm really, I wanna be in the, I wanna be in the momentum of creativity when I'm, mm. so many of the choices that I made were actually early on in the process of revising over and over again, because as right. the came around, I got more and more intimidated by where I saw where the book was going. And yeah. I think, oh, I have to adjust the trajectory again. I have to subtly adjust the tra trajectory and I have to make sure right. that, that everything that I see happening is set up adequately from the beginning, not just in terms yeah. of, also in terms of, in terms of tonally and in terms of how characters are presenting themselves and, and even not to make sure that they're consistent, but to make sure that they're different enough. Yeah. And, yeah. But the, the, big, the big change was just, was just the ending. It, I, it was the big thing that I had to rewrite and it was a headache. It was, <laughs> it just wasn't working because it's to do, to take a book that's in one place tonally and take it somewhere else totally. Right. I really wanted to do that because yeah. I thought it was exciting and I've seen movies that do that, but I don't really see a lot of books that do that. At least I can't mm. think of any off the top of my head. So I really wanted to try that, but it just didn't, it just didn't work the first time around. And so yeah yeah i mean i think there's like a lot of ambition there you know and a lot of like sort of subversiveness when you which what, what with what you tried to do because even like we were talking about this a little bit people do talk about this as like a social media book a lot but it's really not something i clock too much and i think that's a testament to sort of like I think the easy thing, like we both went to MFAs, so we know the phrase like low hanging fruit or <laughs> the classic thing that's easy to kind of like make fun of or to um, talk shit about. And I thought she did a really cool move of like introducing, like having social media be a really big part of this book. But and perhaps I'm wrong. I didn't really feel like you were trying to make a commentary on it or the commentary is just like the sort of like fact of like it's. 2020 2021 people use instagram it's yeah. almost weirder if you don't and i feel like literature is always i joke like about like 10 to 15 years if not more behind in tech <laughs> <laughs> like because they don't put anything yeah. in at all or writer and I, I get why they don't it's kind of boring to read about scrolling to read about that and so i'm rambling but what was there ever a point where you're like maybe I shouldn't have social media in this. Like, when did you commit to that? Did you know you were going to? I, I, I have a lot of trouble with it. Like in my book, I just didn't talk yeah. about it at all. Cause I yeah. was like, like, you know what? Let's just not even get in there. Well, and I understand why, because yeah, I don't think this is the only reason that people talk about it as a social media novel, but by mm. talking about social media and naming it, right. it, it, it weirdly, implies to or it reads as if it's trying to say something about social media but yeah yeah truly yeah. some people i don't know but yeah for me truly i was thinking just in just in straight verisimilitude mm -hmm. i'm thinking this is i know who these characters are and 
if I want them to stalk this person and be obsessed with this person, <laughs> like the easiest prism through which I can refract all of their crazy desires is yeah. the most obvious one that we that we all use. Yeah. Yeah. It's like if there's a commentary to be made, it's not that social media good, social media bad, mm -hmm. just that the simplicity with which you can be obsessed with someone is now available through an app that is free <laughs> and that you can get on your phone. I joke all the time. I'm like, how am I supposed to get over anyone I date when I can know what they're doing every hour of a day, you know, and that it's not a commentary. It's just a fact. <laughs> so. I mean, it's, it's true. And it's also, it does, it does reshape our relationships to a degree because yeah you know, this person who you're not hanging out with anymore, it doesn't matter that you're, they're physically not in front of you. You still know what's right. going on in their lives. And there are people who are just tangential friends, people I've run into at parties mm -hmm. five or six <laughs> times and right. who I'm not close with, who I know a right. lot about just because I follow them on Instagram and they follow me. And we might even totally. have, there are a couple people where I only talk to them on Instagram. We just right. never talk in person, but that's our relationship occurs just just there but it does create this illusion in some ways I don't even know if it is an illusion because that's just how mm -hmm. friendship and intimacy works now but it is a greater intimacy than you would have clearly if you didn't have this access yeah well even look right now like oh my gosh like so many of my coworkers like know what my bedroom looks like <laughs> like you're you see you know what my living room looks like now you know yeah. like the color of my pillows and my couch and I don't know so I think it's that funny thing of like, you don't really need to uh, <laughs> make a huge point about social media. The point is in itself. And anyway, I thought you did that very cool with your book, with just having it be there. So um, yeah, I, uh, something else I was thinking about was like, how much did you think about these characters beforehand? Like, was there ever a version where it was just Remy or just Alicia? When did you land on the idea of like a couple? Because it would have been a very different book if it was just Remy pining after this girl on social media mm -hmm. um, with no Alicia around or vice yeah. versa even too. I'd love- to she loves her. She loves Jen too, even yeah. perhaps more than him, which is funny. That's okay. really- <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, I, I wish that I had an answer that was genuine, but it, I mean, <laughs> it, I, I don't, I don't remember these things totally. I do know that my okay. idea, Alicia was not a part of the picture. No, and I expect that what happened was that I started writing this Remy character because I was thinking about it initially as a story between Remy and Jen primarily. Right. And then yeah. I honestly conceived of it as a story between Remy and Jen and Horace who is a uh, hmm. boyfriend. Yeah, that Jen's boyfriend. Eagle eye view of the story as I envisioned right. it. But then I'm sure what happened is that I started writing this character, Remy, and he was, and then he just needed someone to talk to. <laughs> like, I think that's probably what happened. Right. Although I don't actually know if that's completely. Was there even a version too? Like, it's it sounds so funny. It's like, I think Alicia almost is like, I wouldn't even say she's like the audience, mm. but she kind of represents to me a lot of goodness mm. or like she's like an innocent in mm. some way. Cause like the decision, oh God, I don't want to reveal anything, but like, you know, it's like, she really is kind of along for the ride in some ways mm -hmm. and her life becomes so entangled in this, in a way that's sad to me because it's stemming from the fact that she's so desperately in love with her boyfriend yeah to a degree or at least what they have together or in love with the idea of not being alone yeah so yeah. i don't know it's interesting because you know alicia is an audience in some ways yeah. very much an audience with remy like yeah. what they are bonding over is what's uniting them is their own voyeurism they are yeah. both well put like, I mean, there's something very private about that because mm -hmm. clearly as an audience member, you're in the dark, no one is looking at you. There's something very private about that. Right. And 
And so when they're doing it together and they're making something which is, because an, an audience experience is, is actually pretty solitary most of the mm. time. So yeah. for them to have this intimate audience experience together, I think is what, is what yeah. really reinforces their bond. Yeah, that's, that's such a smart way to put it. And now I'm thinking about it. It's like, like, it sounds really weird and maybe I'm off, but like the way that like Alicia and Remy engage with this sort of fantastical character is how I imagine if like, I could yeah. read my favorite book with my partner. Yeah. If I could just like, it's fun to share an obsession with someone or, yes. you know, like those sort of fantastical thoughts in your head, if you could express them to someone, mm -hmm. it's bonding and freeing and I don't know. I, I'm very glad you added Alicia is oh, uh, yeah. at no, the end me. of the day. I think it made the story so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the This is a question I did warn Beth about ahead of time. <laughs> and if anyone ever writes something, I hope who <laughs> interviews you warns you. Uh, what are some books that you've loved recently? Every time I've been asked this and I don't prep for it, I'm horrified. Yeah. I can't remember a damn thing. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Um, well, right now I'm reading Pachinko. I know I'm so late. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. no, it's a great book. It's really great. I mean, it's nice in a way that I, that I get to experience it now. Yeah. So that's, I'm reading that. And then I'm reading, um, I'm reading a set of Stefan Zweig novellas. Mm. Um, cool. But this is a question what I'm reading now or, or what I, what I've loved that I've read recently. You let's do both. So you said what oh. you're reading now. What have you loved recently? And I we let's do recently. Like can be like a year because sometimes I feel like I read a lot. Sometimes I feel like I've only read two books in like six months. You know what you mean? You know, yeah. Reading time is is weird. I mean, I I am <laughs> I have loved these books that I'm reading. So I don't. They're not mutually exclusive. But right. the a book that I read recently that I did really love uh, mm -hmm. is called Daryl by Jackie S. Oh, I don't know that one. No, I haven't. Very cool. I think people are, they're talking about it. I think they're going to be talking about it a lot more. I think, okay. I think it's really, I think it's a sort of sleeper hit. I mean, Love it's that. not even really a sleeper hit because it is a hit already. <laughs> for some people. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that book's amazing. So that would be, cool. that's one, of, that's another book that I loved. Great to hear. Yeah, I, um, yeah, it's, I think. Eugene, what about you? Put you on the spot. Putting me on the spot? Oh my God, my heart well, is you pounding. Have to okay. No, 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 I, um. <laughs> I read recently, gosh, I'm like looking over at my little stand. I did read Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. Oh yeah, I read that recently too. Very read... weird, super well paced. I, I thought it was quite odd. I've never read a book quite like it. And I, I mean that with a lot of love in my heart. And then I read um, Sharks in the Time of Saviors by Kwai Strong Washburn. I think maybe I'm butchering the title, but it it came out this last year and it's like a multi-character book in Hawaii oh, cool. and I'm like experimenting my experimenting myself with like a multi-character thing for my next book so it was a cool oh. sort of like um this is how you do it book to read oh. my character that's cool yeah yeah are you do you want to talk a little bit about your next novel and like I I you know yeah. in the barest terms yeah give the people a little taste Sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's tough to talk about totally, but I will say right. that the basic premise is that the main character is this girl who has a button on her thigh and whenever mm -hmm. she pushes it, she makes anybody that she wants shit, shit their pants. <laughs> that rocks. Yeah. I, I can't even like, it's, uh, only a book Beth could come up with. <laughs> Hell <you>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. How are, um, how, so is there anything you're doing this time around that feels different than Super. a touch of Jen? Are you finding it like, do you feel the sophomore slump? Like how are, how are you feeling about book two? Sophomore slump? Oh man. Yeah. yeah I'm feeling, <laughs> I'm, what, are you feeling the sophomore slump? Or are you just excited about your multi-character? No, I, I'm, I'm horrified. I, I'm always <laughs> horrified <laughs> by the prospect. It's, it's intimidating. Yeah. It, it's really weird to be writing a second book in the midst of coverage about a first book and then yeah. being, having to talk about a first book. But I think that's yeah. how it always is. That's just, that's just yeah. Weird. I was going to say, have you found like the weird thing is that like, 
maybe it's a personal thing. I think I'm just so, I hate being a story repeater and I hate just repeating myself. And even though like with like, God, it's been a year now, but like with my first book, everything I was saying was the truth. Mm-hmm. But when you say something like over and over, it feels like a lie. And it's just a weird headspace, I think, to really? get into with a book, you know? And I don't know, how long were you working on a touch gen? Like a couple years? Yeah, I worked on it for... Uh, about a year and a half yeah and I mean so I guess a year and a half you sell it what another year until it comes out like I think uh, readers and people in general and even like writers like it was shocking to me I'm like oh my god I'm like these books like really sit in your mind for like a, a period longer than like just the writing of it or the crafting of it and even after it's done like shoot like I don't know how many more events you have but it takes a while to recover from it, I think, a little bit. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, and you just have to you just have to stay in that in that headspace. Yeah. Well, I, I hope you know too. I mean, it's just like even if you are repeating stuff over and over, like it's it's coming from a place of truth and like people read the book, they love it. I've read a touch agenda so many people and it's made me seem like a cooler person. That like oh, I have cool. taste. That That's I have what taste. Love to hear. That's the ultimate. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. I um I guess like before we get into reader questions, when I like to, are there like, and maybe you don't remember, but is there a book you read or certain books you read that made you want to be a writer or that like convinced you to take this seriously? Or I, I don't know, I guess just that I want to be a writer moment. There's a couple answers there. I think cool. I would preface it by saying, I always knew that I wanted to be a writer on some level, but it, it felt a little off to me because the representations of writers that I knew just seemed mm. really horny. Um, I didn't, I didn't, yeah. it seemed like a really self-serious, solitary <laughs> job. Yeah. Because partly because for a long time, my idea of like what writers were just came from this movie with Renee Zellweger. I think it's <laughs> and Which one? It's called Run True Thing. I hope I'm, I hope I'm right about that. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'll look it up when we're off. Maybe I'll watch yeah, it. I, mean, tonight. I don't know if I'm recommending this movie because I haven't seen it since I was very young. <laughs> um, but it definitely affected me in a big way. I was like, that's what writers are like because her dad is this kind of narcissistic, uh, great literary man who wears mm. a black turtleneck and hangs out at his house and has, you know, <laughs> dinner parties where they drink wine. And that just seemed so, that just, that just seemed really, embarrassing to me and so I never like so I never told people oh I want to be a writer because I was sure that they would imagine something like that and totally. that was not what I it just seemed so not fun to do to do that um yeah. and then also I think because a, a lot of the people like one person that I was really into as a teenager was Cormac McCarthy who was mm. very serious so I thought yeah, there's still a part of me I'm like that is a writer and I'm like trying to decode that from my mind yeah. anyway continue yeah but I yeah, yeah I think someone who influenced me more than I realized was uh actually when I was literally 10 or 11 I got really into David Sedaris and, oh fun <laughs> and I was not actually allowed to read his books because yeah. my parents thought they were inappropriate so I had to just <laughs> um but I didn't like think of him as like a writer writer because mm. he on the radio so I was just like oh this is he's just a he's just a radio guy but this part is on paper I didn't as a real writer but he but then I did years later when I was a high schooler I my parents took me to Dallas to see him read in person because he tours a lot you know he's like a real he's a real uh guy around town and he afterwards he signed he signed books and I stood in line Mm -hmm. and he said, oh, are you in high school? And I said, yes. And he was, cause I was, you know, really, a li- I was a little starstruck and he had yeah. this giant jar of condoms next to him. And <laughs> Jesus. He, and Love he that. took a, a condom out and he gave it to me because I said I was in high school. And he was like, this one is extra lubricated. Only use it for anal sex. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> like, what what did you- <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, what did your parents say to that? They were, I think they were uh, delighted and terrified. <laughs> and, 
but I think that it was really exciting for me because I, it was the beginning of me realizing, oh, a writer doesn't have to be a certain way. A, a, a writer can just be like anyone. They can do it however they want. They can, they can pass out condoms at their book signings if they want. <laughs> That's incredible. So I yeah. think that was part of what made me sort of understand a little bit that that was maybe closer to the type of writer that I wanted to be, maybe. Yeah. So, you know, I think there were other books that maybe triggered where I wanted to go in the in, in literary terms. But mm. as far as just personas, I think he was definitely a big influence there. No, that can be like a big thing too, because I think realizing that like, writing influences don't have to come from like the traditional sources of like the same books can make you start seeking out like writing and ideas in different places like like I had someone like Dave Chappelle was a really big oh, yeah. influence on me as a writer and like you know he's not even a fiction writer or a traditional yeah. writer but it's like he writes all his jokes mm -hmm. in the way that he structures a joke I found really interesting and how he can just talk like I would never pause anything he did like I can listen to that guy talk for hours and it's because he really knows how to draw an yeah. audience in and that that that's a tool you can use in, in multiple mediums. Yeah. And anyway, that's just very cool. That's your first big moment wasn't with what you would call like a traditional fiction writer. Yeah, I guess yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, hey, let's like, you know, open up to some questions. Do I hit the Q&A button here? Great. Thanks, Devin. Um, here we go. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to figure out how this works. Um, were there certain like readers that you really wanted to reach within your work, or hmm. like who was your ideal reader when writing this? Hmm. It's it's this is an interesting question because I think it's something that because you've been in an MFA program. So, yes. yes. So I think it's something that we talk a lot about in MFA mm -hmm. programs. And I don't know that it, I've ever really gotten very far with that question, just mm. because I think that the work that I gravitate towards most is often not work written by people who have a ton in common with me. Because the whole fun that. of it yeah. right, is that you get to experience something that you wouldn't otherwise experience, which is not to downplay. Totally lights of you know no, no, no. very relatable that that you can you know that you recognize so much which is part of like why I enjoyed putting real landmarks in the book is I was like oh yeah. that that person goes to that bar they'll enjoy this you know mm -hmm. but yeah For I don't sure. think that that's something that because it's just so I just don't know that you can always write in the direction of who your ideal reader is For sure. you never know you just, you know, you're, you're never really, I guess I would say that my ideal reader and probably the ideal reader for a lot of people is just whoever they care about, who they want to like their work, you know? So for me, that would just yeah. be my boyfriend probably that I just mainly write <laughs> to, um, to make my boyfriend laugh or to make him really sad. So <laughs> totally. I love that. And I think yeah. like sort of that like personal touch mm -hmm. means the world. And there's also something I think too of like, even if you aren't realizing it, the confidence to be like, well, they're going to like it. Mm -hmm. or they don't know that they're going to like this because uh, I can't predict everything. Like if I was in charge of picking everything that I was going to read, like this is what the plot is going to be, or this is the thing I, I'd run out of books. I like quickly, you know, like I'm so grateful for writers like you that uh, expand sort of like my tastes in my evolution as a reader. So very cool. Yeah. Um, I guess like last question too about like the MFA, like what what was your I guess like favorite thing about it, and was there anything you didn't like about it or that you were glad it taught you? Yeah, because yeah. I guess like a lot of people that like go to these events and people that are interested in in fiction are are writers too, and it's always good to advise them. I guess. Oh yes. <laughs> oh, do I have advice? Well. <laughs> I mean, 
I, I was in a very strange position, which is that I had finished my book before I even came into the program at Brooklyn College. So I went mm -hmm. into it with a novel that I didn't know whether or not I was going to be able to sell. And I was mm -hmm. just hedging my bets in some ways. But also I was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to sell this novel. That just right. like, So that was like what you hoped to get out of it. You're like, I'm going to sell a novel. Yeah, I know. No, I don't think so, actually. Like, I'm, in, I'm inclined to say that, but I, if I think more carefully about it, I think I was just, I think I, I wanted to commit to writing in, in a real way, which yeah. people do. I heard that. You say, okay, I'm going to spend money on learning how to be better. I'm going to spend so much mm -hmm. time commuting to this place and then hanging <laughs> in the classroom for a long time. And then I also think it's, it's, the things that you learn in a program, you, you never know how good the teachers are gonna be until you're really there, but you definitely, yeah. and I think I got really lucky because I really loved the teachers in my program. Um, mm. and, and it was wonderful to be able to learn from them without thinking, oh, I have to finish my novel now. Oh, I have to finish my novel now because it was, right. kind of, it was a bit behind me. So I was, I was in a different headspace and I could just give myself over to learning. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I, for, I sort of forgot what part of the question was. Did I? No. Did I liked about it and things that I things that I didn't like. I mean, the main thing that I didn't like was working while being in an MFA program. I think that was it's really tough. tough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the big struggle with a lot of these programs. Like, are are you able to? dedicate mm -hmm. your full time to writing but at the same time it, it's realistic right like it's, it's hard to ever make writing your full day job so I guess you got a taste of like what it's like to sort of balance all of that you know like deciding like I'm gonna have two jobs yes. one is to be a, a regular adult in the real world but also having um, a second job being like I'm gonna be a writer this yeah I'm gonna approach it but were you working yeah. when you were in your MFA yeah, I was too. So I, I had a similar, like, it felt like I was missing out on certain things. But at the same time, I don't know what I, if there would ever been a, uh, been a time I could have just only done the MFA. So yeah. it's always a juggling act, I think. And, you know, all no, the better I, for it. I'm lucky to be able to just spend some time just doing, just doing that. Because yeah. you supported me for a little while while I was trying to sell the book. Very just, cool. Well, but it was, it was a just night and day because I got to class and I was like, well, rested and I had done all this. <laughs> wow, this is fantastic. I love this. And I was mm -hmm. like reading people's workshop stories and writing like three pages of notes on it. Like, wow, like I just love giving feedback. This is so great. I'm learning so yeah. much. It was, it was it's a totally different experience for sure. For sure. Well, I'm glad that like, you know, you've had this amazing book come out and you have some time now to work on the second one with that sort of freedom that you were talking about. So, um, yeah. 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 Uh, congrats, Beth. Is there anything you want to say to the audience before we get out here for a sec? No, just thank you guys so much for coming. And um, I don't know, the book is really good. You should read it. Yeah, I can second that. Please buy a touch of Jen, preferably do it through Green Apple and uh, Feel free to hit up Beth or I if you have any further questions after this event. Thank you so much, Green Apple. This was a... Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank Gene. You. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here, both of you. This has been a, a fantastic conversation to be a fly on the wall for. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. And uh, good night. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.